doctor in the TARDIS. Next stop everywhere. The Doctor Who Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the TARDIS once again, ready to talk some more modern Who with my wonderful friend, my fellow Fandom Zone co-host, and someone who gets frustrated with the Flash TV series just as much as I do, DJ Nick. How you doing, Nick? Buonasera, ciao. Mi fa tantissimo piacere essere qua con te oggi e parlare di vampiri a Venezia. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. I guess the, the TARDIS translation matrix didn't work there for a moment, <laughs> Charles. Did you understand what I was saying there? Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. Okay, great. I think maybe the translation Although I was missing, matrix I, need, I, there. I feel like I need subtitles. <laughs> no, yeah, so obviously what or, I did Or, you say... know, like a Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef dubbing. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I just think that our, the translation matrix was off for a moment there. Mm-hmm. We've got a, a blip. No, I, I, But it was, it was bellissimo. Thank you. I try. <laughs> You'd think I'd be able to speak this language having lived here all my life. But... Well, you certainly speak it better than I do. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's super, super happy to be here uh, with you. And, uh, you know, it's been a while since I've had a chance to uh, talk some Doctor Who. So uh, thank you very much for, for having me on today. Yeah, last time you were on, we talked Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. We had a lot oh, of fun yeah. with that one, didn't we? Yeah, but good old Peter Cushing. Yes, yes, it was. So I appreciate you coming on this time. We, we had a little hole in the schedule because sadly someone dropped out for very understandable reasons. So I really appreciate you filling in. And, we, you know, this is an episode that we talked about possibly doing. Mm-hmm. So it makes a perfect sense. So here at episode 232, Nick and I are going to be talking The Vampires of Venice. Or at least the vampires of Croatia filling in for Venice, as we'll, we'll discuss. I, I guess the I guess maybe it's so expensive maybe to film in Venice. I don't know. I mean, it well, used there to is be... a re- there apparently there is a reason. I'll cover that in my trivia. Oh, great! Yeah, thank. You. Please do, Charles. I did do a little homework on that. So if the source that I got this information from is accurate, I'll tell you why. So okay. this was the sixth episode of series five from 2010. Written by Toby Whithouse, who wrote the previous episode, School Reunion, which, of course, reintroduced Sarah Jane Smith to a whole new generation of Doctor Who fans. So cheers Mm -hmm. to that. One of my favorite stories from the David Tennant era. Also responsible for The God Complex and A Town Called Mercy. Then the Peter Capaldi era stories, Under the Lake slash Before the Flood and The Lie of the Land. And he also wrote the Torchwood episode, Greeks Bearing Gifts. Mm-hmm. But to a lot of people, he's also known as the creator of the original UK version of Being Human, which I was a particular fan of back in the day because I kind of had a little bit of a thing for Lenora Critchlow on that show. Well, who didn't, I suppose. Right. <laughs> this was directed by Johnny Campbell and, of course, stars Matt Smith as the 11th Doctor, Karen Gillan as Amy Pond, and technically Arthur Darvel kind of becomes a companion with this one as well, yeah. right? I, I this is this is where I think we can officially call Rory a companion from this point on. Mm-hmm. So before we get into guest cast and, and trivia, I know this is, you know, you've watched this one before. Mm-hmm. Has it been a while since you watched this one or was it just something you, you pop in regularly or well, or what? Uh, no, it'd been a while since I'd actually watched this, to be honest, because funnily enough, the, the, the episodes I really love to binge or like to watch – on her own repeatedly is actually classic who okay i tend to get my kicks more from that i mean i i love i i I own both you know series series things on dvd both classic and new but for some reason i find classic who more enchanting and more endearing and what have you so it's been a while since i'd seen this 
And I was actually kind of hoping that it had been filmed in Venice. Obviously, I, I'm, in, I'm in Milan, which is not, it's, it's up north, and Venice is not that too far away. It's about an hour train ride from here. Okay. And um, I appreciate and, you doing this for those of us who are geographically challenged. <laughs> no problem. But yeah, um, Venice is obviously in Veneto, which is uh, the region, uh, which is the region I'm in Lombardy. But yeah, so it's about an hour's train ride. Okay. I'd actually been, been to Venice only twice in my life. Actually, even though I live in the country, but uh, yeah. I think they ar- architecturally they got it, you know, quite quite spot on. I mean, St Mark's Square looked like St Mark's Square and stuff, and okay. th- and really quickly, Charles. What is and you have to kind of is- take it back into account that well, the story is set in 1580 as opposed to. 2021 so of course and what i do want to say is folks if ever you do get to go to venice by train it's it's amazing because you start going and then suddenly you look outside and all there is is literally water and it looks as if the train is traveling through water because obviously that's how high the water level is right and the but it's just fabulous. It's really, I really su- I suggest that folks, now that things are starting to open up, to get the chance to visit our beautiful country, promoting Italy here, yeah. <laughs> come and visit Venice because it really, there really is nothing like it. And it really is, is it's worth, it's one of those cities that I think one should see in their lifetime. Well, you know, with something actually my wife, Lori, and I discussed the possibility of this week because apparently Europe is now okaying American travelers to come back to the European Union mm-hmm. once again. Yeah, and even- and even our prime minister officially uh, came out today, Draghi, who is uh, actually is, is named Dragons, which literally means dragons. Excellent. Came out, came out saying that, yeah, UK, um, Brits, Americans, and so on are welcome back to spend their money in our country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, come on back. Bring all the euros. Yes. Bring us the money. Bring yeah. us the money. Yeah, that that's... sounded more Russian than Italian, but oh well. <laughs> No, kind of more, it sounded more Godfather a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, guest cast this time, we have the recently departed Helen McCrory, mm-hmm. who sadly passed away just last month on April 16th, 2021, at the age mm-hmm. of 52. So, the age that I am turning, she passed away at. Not very reassuring, personally, but, but it, it's very sad because she's such a great villain in this one. So it, at least we can uh, appreciate this performance that we got from her. Very good for as, sure, do, yeah. as Doctor Who fans. So she plays Rosanna Calvieri, notable because, well, to Harry Potter fans, probably recognize her as Narcissa Malfoy, a.k.a. the mother of Draco Malfoy exactly. in the Harry Potter movies. Nick and I probably recognize her as Madame Kali from Penny Dreadful. Dreadful. Yeah. She was brilliant in that. Yeah, and she's not the the, the last, the, the the only actor from that series that we're going to talk mm-hmm. about here today. She was also in the movie Skyfall, so we have another James Bond Doctor Who connection. And uh, rather appropriately, she was actually in the movie Interview with a Vampire. Yeah, I guess she, she <laughs> kind of gets a little typecast. <laughs> She either playing evil witches or yeah. vampires or supernatural creatures. I guess maybe she was the type of because she does it so well. Well, the villains are always the best roles, right? You know, you get to exactly. really, you get to really chew the scenery and just really get into it and have fun. At least until you get killed off somehow <laughs> by the, by the good guy. We also had Alex Price as Francesco. Mm-hmm. Like I said, another actor from Penny Dreadful. He played Proteus on that show. Uh, he did fantastic performance. He was also in the BBC series Merlin and also the UK version of Being Human. So maybe Toby Woodhouse kind of realized that, oh, this guy might be good for that. Being loyal maybe to his actors, yeah. Maybe. Nothing wrong with that. We have Lucian Mizamati. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, as Guido. Yep. Who really doesn't look like a Guido, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> I see what you did. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no problem with the actor, but just doesn't really scream Guido to me. <laughs> you know, he was in the movie, or excuse me, the TV series Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. He's also recently appeared on His Dark Materials, which I've been enjoying on HBO, and oh, also yeah. the BBC series Luther, starring Idris Elba. Ah, uh, well, another one, another great show. Yeah, yeah. So a very good character actor, I think. And then we mm-hmm. had Alicia Bailey as Isabella who I kind of recognize because she was in the 2010 version of Dirk Gently. Ah, this was right. the one that was like three Dirk Gently movies long. Ah, and right. you know, like, like a TV movies, a series of TV movies. 
Were those the ones with Elijah Wood? Not the one that, you know, with Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency that ran for two seasons on BBC America. Oh, so, but was it the one with Elijah Wood? Is that the one? The no, 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 no. This is uh, okay. the one that starred Stephen Mangan as Dirk Oh, Gently, okay, okay. Which I kind of recommend. I really enjoyed that series. It only, like I said, it was only like three TV movies, but I really enjoyed it. Mm. Kind of obscure, but I definitely recommend checking out if you have the, have the chance. Using the power of the interwebs, of course. Trivia. We talked about it being filmed in Croatia. So apparently due to the time that it would take to cover up all the modern shops found in present-day Venice, mm. they decided, well, it's going to be cheaper if we just film this in Croatia. So they, they filmed it in, you know, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Trogir, T-R-O-G-I-R, Croatia, right. making it the first episode of a Doctor Who universe show to be filmed in a formerly communist nation. Nice. Right? And when the doctor reaches in, of course, this is kind of an Easter egg, but when he goes in to pull out his psychic paper to show the five female vampires, yeah. the vampire girls, he accidentally shows off his library card instead, which, of course, has a great picture of William Hartnell. Which might be a reference that might be lost on the younger generation who don't know who William Hartnell is. I mean, obviously, it's for those who obviously, I guess, had followed Doctor Who religiously. Yeah. But I think maybe you just those who just watched New Who are like, who the heck is that guy? You know? Yeah. Well, they probably recognize it maybe if, remember, just five episodes earlier in the 11th hour, they did get kind of to get to see all the doctors before, oh, yeah, Matt, because, before um, Matt Smith steps out as the 11th doctor in his costume. True. So so if they remember that, they would make that connection, perhaps. True. Because, you know, hey, the kids these days, they do love the interweb, so they they probably <laughs> did a little research after that, I'm guessing, hopefully. But it's still a very cool nod to us older fans, regardless. Definitely. So writer Toby Whithouse originally planned to write a different episode set in some sort of labyrinth. But executive producer Stephen Moffat and Piers Winger thought that the story was too similar to other episodes in the series. And they asked him to write something else. Oh, okay. So they decided to push Whithouse's original idea to the Mm -hmm. next series, which, of course, turned out to be The God Complex. Because, remember, it was kind of set in a hotel, a strange hotel, and you had Mm -hmm. a minotaur prowling the hotel. Yeah, because it was very much also almost a a labyrinth in itself as well, the way the hotel kind of... Exactly. ...almost seemed to to go on and on and on for, for sure, yeah. The working titles for this episode included Blood and Water and the House of Calvieri, Mm. but Mark Gatiss suggested the title of The Vampires of Venice, inspired by the song Werewolves of London by Warren Zevon. <laughs> and his I hair suppose. was perfect. <laughs> I suppose that could have been a nice sequel to that song. Right? Ow, Vampires of Venice. <laughs> Ow. I, I could see that, yes. If, if, if Warren were, were around today, they could definitely do that. <laughs> oh, draw water. <laughs> exactly. See, it's already written. It's right there, right? <laughs> as, you, as you can kind of tell, uh, Nick and I get a little uh, goofy after all the Phantom Zone episodes we do together. So we can... Exactly. <laughs> Just seeing Nick's smiling face always puts me in that mood. Oh, well, <laughs> I said, hey, there, there's that chemistry going. What, what go. can we do? Well, uh, well, well, hopefully everybody else enjoys it at least. Yeah. All right. I certainly hope so. The script was originally too long, and as a result, they had to cut several sequences, some even after they've been filmed. So check your Blu-rays for those deleted scenes. These included a fight scene with the Doctor and Rosanna Stewart, a longer fight sequence between Rory and Francesco, and some dialogue between the Doctor and Amy following the climax. Hmm. So that probably, you know, that closing scene where they're, kind of wrapping up and getting ready to get into the TARDIS, there's probably an extended version of that. Right. And also in the original script, a big monster was supposed to rise out of the water in Isabella's death scene. But in Doctor Who tradition, this would have been too expensive. (laughs) Well, the budget is what it is. BBC's like, oh, we kind of, the budget's what it is. We can't do this. And in fact, I think we barely get to see, you know, the actual brother, the actual sons. It's all implied. It's, I, I, I kind of picture like some some intern under the water in a bathing Doing suit. The, making the bubbles. Yeah, like, like you know, um, 
just kind of like uh, you know blowing bubbles up with a straw underneath. I don't know, but yeah, in fact, I can imagine the director going, and the cue bubbles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, just a hunch, anyway. So, so, of course, Stephen Moffat asked Toby Whithouse to make it "quote unquote" invisible. So, <laughs> so Stephen Moffat getting his J and T on there a little bit. Mm, yeah. But uh, how much bu- how much budget does Doctor Who have to have to do what Doctor Who wants to do? I'm just saying. In fact, it's not like you have to do like the super CGI monster. We are used to right. kind of corny monsters in Doctor Who. You can even come up with like an inflatable creature from the Black Lagoon and we'd yeah. be happy. Right. I mean, you know, we if we could tolerate the drash eggs from Carnival of Monsters, I'm pretty Thank sure you. we can handle just about anything, right? Exactly. I I do think so. <laughs> yeah. Or the you know, or the dinosaurs from Invasion of the Dinosaurs, if you remember those horrible things. That's probably the worst. <laughs> that's probably that, I think that's probably I think you're right. I think that's probably the worst special effect Doctor Who has yes. ever done. And that's saying yeah. a lot, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying is we are used to this kind of stuff. Yeah. So you don't have to call Spielberg or what have you to say we need or the creature shop or Jim Henson or the, the Jim Henson creature shop saying yeah. we need something really, really cool. Well, you'd think they would have a standard CGI monster template and then all you had to do was put a, like a, a CGI skin over it for the for the particular episode, right? You figure. They do. I mean, they do that for characters in video games. So why can't you do this kind of the same thing? I don't get it. Exactly. What is known, I think, is a sprite, I think, is what it's called. Oh, look at you. <laughs> look at you, all high-tech guy there. <laughs> well, this is, why, this, this is why I have you on, right? Make me, <laughs> you know, make the show look good by your uh, expertise. Excellent. Well, that's what they did with Mortal Kombat, in fact. I mean, all the ninjas were the same yeah. ninja, it's <laughs> just different colors. Copy, paste, copy, paste, change color, exactly. change color, change color, yeah. I mean, the original, yeah, Reptile, Sub-Zero, and Scorpion were just the same ninja, just made blue, yellow, right. and green. Right, that <laughs> makes sense. That makes sense. All right, any other trivia that you think I overlooked? No, I think you pretty much covered it all, Charles. I mean, as I said, the only sad thing was we didn't really get to see the brothers, and what we got to see was this foaming yeah. water, which was a bit of a letdown. We didn't get to see the blokes. Where are the blokes? Exactly. I mean, since apparently those are super infested waters with these with, with these creatures in them, you think we even just some silhouettes. All you see is this water and the bubbles. Yeah. Now that you you brought this up, I you made me think about this. Mm. So. I know we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves in our discussion, but <laughs> why did the doctor just leave the brothers in the water? Good question. Yes, because you, you've left and right. they're still, they're it, still there. Still so so anybody these... that goes into the water is going to die, right? Exactly. When you thought it was safe to go back into the water. <laughs> right. You still left this incredible hazard and you just, you know, scamper off in your TARDIS laughing. Exactly. I can imagine then cut seeing the guy like walking along going, do, 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 bomb yep. dead. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Or at least, you know, I don't know. Do, uh, do the blokes, for lack of a better term, do they attack guys as well as women or just women? Well, I think they probably would be omnivorous, I suppose. I would it think doesn't matter. So, right? I think as long as it's meat, as long as they're being fed meat, I think yeah. it's like any predator. Yeah. You know, I don't think a lion distinguishes between eating a woman, a man, or a child. Right. So. Cause, well, we only saw them eat women, so that's one of the reasons I'm bringing this up. But, um, but uh, you know, you just it's still a threat. So I just it's that kind of like like it's a kind of a loose story story thread that kind of gnaws at me a little bit as do as I was watching. It, Rewatching this episode. I agree. Yeah. You could just open the portal or something, or you know, done so, or in the TARDIS saying, "I've just called the pest control. They'll be taking them away," or something like that. That's right. That's right. All right. You didn't even have to show us, but yeah. Yeah, no. So we only have. We we're only going to do uh, three topics today. Okay. But so topic number one, let's talk the eleventh Doctor, Amy and Rory our new TARDIS team, because, of course, like I said, this is where Rory officially becomes a companion, right? Mm -hmm. After appearing in one episode, the 11th hour, at the beginning of the season. 
And the reason for this is actually, you know, the doctor showing up in the middle of Rory's stag party the night before his wedding, of all things, mm-hmm. popping into a stripper's cake to <laughs> to jump out and tell Rory and all of his friends that Amy just kissed him at the end of the previous episode, uh, Flesh and Stone. Yeah. Slightly awkward. So the doctor realizing something needs sorting out takes Rory and brings him aboard the TARDIS with the intention of trying to get them to realize, at least get Amy to realize that, you know, when they go back to their ordinary lives, things are going to be drastically changed. But with the unspoken reason that he needs Amy, I think, to realize she's in love with Rory and not him. Well, yeah, because she was supposed to marry him up yeah. until that point. Because, in fact, obviously, what the beginning of the scene uh, of this of this uh, episode is, we have, of course, Rory calling from the stag party. So yeah. he, uh, as far as he's concerned, they're still going to get married. Because, yeah. obviously, he does not know what, what's, what Amy's, Amy's been gallivanting around and so on. So, uh, yeah. And so, I, I so, what did, so what did you, like, so what did you make of, uh, of all this? You know, of, of the doctors playing to kind of play Cupid for Amy and Rory the night before their wedding. Technically, well, because I guess the doctor at this point thinks that Amy has fallen in love with him, and so he obviously doesn't want her to get the wrong idea. And he yeah. knows that obviously she's supposed to get married, but obviously in typical doctor fashion, he kind of goes about things the wrong way. And he's, he, he, you know, you don't really tell the guy who's that, 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 that you about, you kissed the woman he was about to marry. You kind of don't do that, or you use, and you don't you certainly don't, don't mention that she's a great kisser. By the way, you're a lucky guy. That's right. You know, so in typical Doctor fashion, or I suppose in Gallifreyan fashion, because I guess uh, that's the way they do it on Gallifrey, because them it's all the same. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I guess he maybe wants to just try to make, also make um, Amy realize that that is not what she wants and that she's possibly enamored of the Doctor because it's maybe an infatuation for her because he's so different from what she's used to. It's almost right. like the exotic of the Doctor is possibly what Amy is so attracted to. Because obviously, as I said, the, uh, prior to that, she, she seemingly loves Rory. If she's going to marry him, you mm-hmm. think. I don't think anybody's forcing her to marry the guy. It's not an arranged marriage. Right. So so it's. Uh, I guess the Doctor's doing his best to kind of make amends, if you will, or as I said, just make Amy see reality. What kind of saddens me is how much Rory gets emasculated throughout this episode. Mm-hmm. Well, you Pretty know, this, this, is, this is not, you know, this is not the only time this happens, apparently, because he does kind of get emasculated quite a bit during the Stephen Moffat era. Yeah, here, exactly. This was where it's the, the game. Let's emasculate Rory as much as we can started. Oh. Right. Because here he gets it left, right, and center, be it from Francesco or from the doctor Mm -hmm. or everywhere. It just seems like he is totally inadequate. And as I said, he just is really made to almost look like a wimp in in Amy's eyes. I mean, that's what he thinks Amy thinks about him. But it's terrible. And I think the doctor doesn't really help with that either because the doctor almost seems jealous as well. When it comes to Rory, Rory's clearly jealous. Yeah. But I think the doctor is as well, because the way that Rory answers back to him when he gets on the TARDIS and stuff is like, people don't really, don't really say those kind of things or don't demonstrate more intelligence than I take human beings for being intelligent. And he's almost thrown back that Rory has done his homework on quantum and stuff. It's like, yeah, I thought humans were stupid, and he almost feels challenged by that. I feel. You think he feels a little threatened? Yeah, interesting. Because like, because kind of like I'm the big man here that Rory, yeah. that uh, Amy looks up to, and here comes this guy who's kind of talking about quantum. It almost makes him, you know, quantum mechanics like that. and all that. Yeah. So I think I, I think it's. I mean, I, I think it's. He almost feels slightly threatened by it. He just doesn't like it yeah. that human a human shows more intelligence. In his, in, in the doctor's eyes, a human possesses. I feel okay. So, so do you think it's more that the doctor doesn't want to be like a romantic threat mm. to Rory? The doctor wants just to be the guy, the smartest guy in the room. 
That's exactly it. I think his yeah. ego is challenged. I okay. Mean, that's, that, and we know how much the doctor likes to make everybody know that he's the smartest man in the room. Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> but so. uh, with Amy, you know, because we talk, you know, it's a good thing. I'm really glad that we did um, the time of Angel's Flesh and Stone not too long ago. Because, it, for one thing, it keeps it fresh in my head, right? So, Amy... At the end of that story, at the end of Flesh and Stone, has essentially is now fulfilling her childhood fantasy. Because Mm -hmm. remember, she, she, you know, after the doctor, her, you know, as first encounter with the doctor as a young girl, Amelia Pond, great name. Um, (laughs) you know, she kind of she fixated on the doctor. You know, she it was very much an obsession. She was her. an obsession. She called him the raggedy doctor. You know, everybody apparently in the town of Leavenworth knew about this because probably she constantly talked about the doctor and which I'm sure drove Rory nuts, which may be why at this stage in this episode, why Rory has a bit of a resentment toward the doctor because he's probably heard that for years. Yeah, I mean, we had previously met him in in the in, yeah. in the eleventh uh, hour right. for a brief stint. Yeah. That was pretty much it. But he was quickly think, dismissed by the doctor. So I'm sure first impressions, being what they were, probably yeah. you know didn't exactly get them both off on the right foot right right away. And not to mention, Rory probably thinks that the doctor's trying to steal his girl. Right. Yeah. Exactly. He feels very threatened because let's face it, Rory's a bit insecure. Mm-hmm. Which is okay, but you know he is he is a little bit insecure, and you know, and obviously, he just feels like this ordinary guy who, quite honestly, let's face it, can't quite compete with a time lord that's over a thousand years old, you know, at this point, and has his own time and space machine that can go anywhere. So it's kind of hard to compete with that. I do kind of see the comparison with what we'd seen previously with the 10th Doctor, where you'd had their love triangle with Mickey, yeah. the 10th Doctor, and, you know, so I think it's, and Rose. So I think that's almost that trope repeating itself once again, because we do remember that also during the, the 10th Doctor's uh, time, and also even the 9th Doctor even, Mickey felt incredibly threatened by by both the ninth and tenth doctors when it came to them yeah. you know, potentially stealing his girlfriend. Yeah. So we're kind of having that again when he's it like, comes to the eleventh one. He's kind of like the new Mickey, almost. Yeah. Although hopefully not the like the real the new <laughs> Noel Clark, fingers crossed, right? I haven't seen anything any dirt on Mr. Darvel yet. So yeah, hopefully yeah. So, we, he so let's, okay. yeah, we'll we won't create that association. So so apologies for that. But um I just mean, obviously, from a narrative perspective. Obviously. Yeah, I, I, know, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. So Rory, you know, confronts the doctor about this because the way he sees it is that everybody wants to impress the doctor, especially Amy. And Rory, I think, is astute enough. This is, a, you know, a pretty, you know, like, like I said, a, a pretty observant point that he makes here is that People want to go out of their way to impress you, yeah. and in the result, in in the process of this, they put themselves in danger for you. Yeah. So essentially, he's letting the doctor know that, hey, you, you know, you could potentially get my fiance killed here. He's and, one of the few who does that, yeah, because most people are like yeah. wowed by what the doctor can do. He's like, I'm right. not really that impressed. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I think there's something to that that the fact that you know. They're not all great friends at the moment, so maybe Rory feels more objective and feels emboldened, at least, to, to kind of say something. You know, to, to Rory's credit, he doesn't just meekly sit by while the doctor does what he does. He expresses his disapproval, and, you know, and one of the, and like, it's very rare to see someone really step up and call out the doctor for his own BS in a lot of ways. Well, yes, because as we said, most people are kind of totally in awe of a man who can travel yeah. through space and time, you know, a, an age, a, an almost ageless alien, if you will, to, in their eyes. Right. So, 
So it, it definitely is, um, you know, I guess so any other person would probably be completely shocked by it, but Rory isn't. And I have to say, Amy doesn't really help either when it comes no, to certain doesn't. situations. Like, oh, you can pose as my brother. He looks more like my boyfriend or my fiance. It's like, Amy, are yeah. you serious? Like, I think to myself, so you're marrying this guy, why? Right. Well, I think, honestly, I think at this stage, I, I kind of theorized about this that, you know, I think Amy is just settling for Rory. She wants the doctor. Right. At this point. But she's settling for Rory because obviously the doctor's not around. And she had developed this relationship with Rory, um, probably because, you know, they've been friends for a while. She felt safe around Rory. She felt comfortable around Rory. And uh, maybe, you know, just to, we know that, you know, she had issues with, you know, having to see a psychiatrist and whatnot because of, you know, whatever lingering issues from her encounter with the doctor as a child sure. and everybody's kind of skepticism of that. True. I mean, I, so, I also wonder whether it's the fact that Amy is a very strong personality. Yeah. Rory is a lot meeker. So maybe it's somebody that she could almost in inverted commas, wear the pants around in the relationship and almost something that she, dominate. Could, that yeah. she could dominate. I yeah. think she almost finds it attractive. The doctor represents more of a challenge in the sense that he is just as strong headed as she is. And some people, you know, when in the relationship, and I'm not generalizing, actually find that very attractive. If you have somebody yeah. who is equally strong headed as you are, there are those who like that relationship where they are the stronger one. And that's maybe what Amy was working for Amy till she met this guy who's like, it's like, whoa, this guy can match me step for step and even more so. So maybe it, she finds that rather alluring as well. Case in point, me and my wife, Lori, <laughs> or as uh, strong-willed as it gets, to be quite perfectly honest. So, so I think so that's I get it that. too. Yeah, I get that. So, you know, she's essentially, you know, you're bringing up a great point. Amy, Amy, for lack of a better word, is the alpha and Rory is the beta. Mm -hmm. So when another alpha like the doctor comes along, you know, especially if it's someone that she's been fantasizing about ever since she met him as a kid, and he, now he looks exactly the same because, you know, he's a time traveler, yeah. um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just two powerful attractions here for her. And poor Rory gets quickly forgotten about it. Like, you know, you... you you mentioned that the fact that Amy's first instinct when they were trying to hatch a plan to go face the Cavieri's was, let's make the doctor my fiance. And you can be my brother. <laughs> and you can be my brother. So essentially that's how she's in her head. This is how she kind of views the doctor and Rory. Yeah, it's a more of a brotherly point. relationship that she right. has with Rory. She's like friend zoning yeah. Rory at this point. Pretty much, you know, she's friend zoning her fiance, yes. which is the horrible, right? And so, so I feel really bad for Rory. Yeah. Maybe it's just because I'm a guy. I don't know, but I feel bad that that Amy isn't, you know, committing. I think to the relationship as much as as he is. Which is why I think is another reason why the doctor wanted to step in here, because this is only going to get worse if we don't do something about that. So, so he gets Rory involved, and in the process, Rory gets a chance to prove himself by facing off against Francesco. Yes. Now, granted, it's Rory versus Francesco. And it's not a really a fair fight. A, armed with a broom or with a mop. Right. I can't recall. I think it's a mop. Yeah. Yeah. Francesco has a sword. That's very sharp, and Rory has an old broom. Yes. That's getting whittled down piece by piece as Francesco slices the the stick part off, you know, the broom handle part. And you don't bring but, a broom to a sword fight. <laughs> but to but but it works out in his favor, even though he has to be rescued by Amy, because yeah. he tried. You know he he had his courage. He faced. Francesco, who is an obviously greater threat. And I think that was the moment that kind of made Amy go a little double take and go like, hey, 
you know, I don't want to, you know, maybe it was concerned that she was going to lose Rory perhaps as well. That made her stop and think about, you know, what really mattered here. What do you think? What do you think the catalyst was to kind of Uh, shift Amy back to Rory? I think, I mean, look, because if we look at the whole thing of like friend zoning him, you know, maybe she's having second thoughts about her marriage with him. Maybe it's just that it's because she cares about him at this point and maybe doesn't. You know, it hasn't maybe reignited the flame of love just yet. But it's really like yeah. he's a guy that I really care about. Because maybe at this point, it's, she's maybe almost torn. Because even at the end of the episode, she says, my boys. So I'm thinking to myself, are yeah. you kind of, you know, what are you trying to do here? Is this going to be some hanky-panky in the TARDIS? Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> a threesome well, in sure, the TARDIS? <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, I'm sure Ang- Amy is angling for the threesome by that comment. <laughs> That's what, Obviously, the doctor's not going to go along with it. Because one of the great things I love about Matt's doctor, he's very clueless about women and relationships. Yes, unlike his previous um, incarnation, who was like the kissing doctor, David Tennant yeah. pretty much snogging any female he could get his hands on. So. Right, right, exactly. You know, you know, he he comes by, uh, you know, a lake and the fish stops swimming. Let's just put it, you know, <laughs> yeah, rather. Uh, you know, let's 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 just kind of uh, address that point a little bit, I guess. But but uh, yeah, this doctor, this incarnation is definitely different from the tenth doctor. He's very clueless about that, so he has no interest in this. You know, it's it's almost like he's like a child in an old man's body, almost. Because his behavior is almost asexual in the sense he doesn't have interest in sex in any kind of way. I mean, technically, he's an old man in a child's body, but. <laughs> He does have for, you know, this thousand year old being does have a very childlike quality to him. Yeah, it's very much still that kind of like I'm not saying it's like, ooh yeah. girls or whatever. It's not that. No, but, but, but you know, you, you know, there's a comment, great comment in The Doctor's Wife yeah. written by the great Neil Gaiman, where he tells um, Amy and Rory to go find their new rooms or something. <laughs> and, you know, Amy or Rory makes this you know comment about. Well, you know, we don't want to, can we not have bunk beds this time? And his, you know, his whole approach is, but it's a bed with a ladder. <laughs> Which goes you know? to show you the naivete almost yes. of, of the doctors. He said it's very childlike. It's very, his candor is almost this very childlike. Yeah. At least this incarnation, anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. But I and but I and I think that that's that's the whole thing. You're know, going back to the whole Amy situation. I just think that it's just um, just that that she maybe cares about Rory. Notice she kisses Rory. Rory doesn't yes. try to kiss her. It's like the heroic moment that you'd get in those kind of Errol Flynn movies where you've saved the damsel and you kind of yeah. lean in and kiss her passionately. She's the one who almost to shut him up, kisses him. Yeah, or to, so being from the '80s, I would almost compare it to like an '80s romantic comedy, where the nerdy guy gets the hot girl at the end That's of the right. movie that he's been, you know, dreaming about the entire movie, only to fail constantly. Yeah, it's almost like that. Shut up and kiss me like, moment. Yeah, it's only you know, like it's a um, um, oh, what's the actor's name? I'm blanking. Never mind. But um, the. John Cusack, that's who I'm thinking. Yeah. John Cusack. It's almost like a John Cusack movie, like Better Off Dead or something. But, but, so Rory, yeah, Rory's kind of like that guy that gets the hot girl, even though technically she was already his, being fiance, being engaged. Mm -hmm. But this is a, this episode obviously is where he, I think he truly wins Amy in spirit. I I do think so, but I thought it was an interesting, it was, it was, it was, um, telling. That it's right. Amy who 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 leans in and basically grabs him and yeah. kisses him, and not Rory yeah. who takes the initiative of, you know, I'm the here. I can puff out my chest and I say, "Come here, baby." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but thankfully, yeah, you know, from this point on, we don't get to see Amy. I mean, she may do a make a flirting comment, but she certainly doesn't try to throw the Doctor up against the TARDIS, back of the TARDIS, like she did at the end. Of flesh and stone anymore. Yeah, those right? are seriously raging hormones. It's like chill, seriously. girl. <laughs> right. It's like she's got her, you know, got him in her bedroom, and you know, she's just like, like she's. This is like her fantasy that she's played out in her head over and over and over again, from the time she was a little, you know, a girl, you know, through teenage, her teenage years into becoming an adult. 
that uh, she this is how she's dreamed of it that it would play out and so uh so we don't get thankfully any more of that nonsense yeah. for Rory's sake if nothing else but I also know it had I knew I know there were some fans who were already not happy with the kissing doctor aka David Tennant because like that's not yeah. how the doctor acts so I think they maybe wanted to move away from that because maybe it was to have some should we say anger from longtime fans like the doctor yeah. is not supposed to fall in love and he's not supposed to fraternize with his companions. Well, he doesn't really need to is the point is that they're supposed to mm -hmm. be friends, you know, they're companions, not lovers. So, so, you know, the question is, well, why don't you, know, why aren't they being treated like that? You know, why aren't the characters being written like that? But, with Russell T. Davies, he wanted to kind of explore that with Rose mm -hmm. and Martha. Thankfully, he didn't do that with Donna. But then when Stephen Moffat came on board, he does that with Amy. Yep. And it was kind of felt like almost like, oh, we're going we, – we finally got this sorted out, and now we're going back to these same old mistakes mm -hmm. of having the companion throw herself at the doctor. That's right. So thankfully, this episode – I think finally, you know, put the kibosh on that one. Yes, exactly. Unless, you know, as we move further, we see the 13th Doctor kissing somebody. I guess we'll have to wait. Yeah, and see. yeah. we haven't, you notice we haven't gotten that. We haven't had any male companions throwing themselves at the Doctor, although maybe Yaz might. Yes, which maybe could be she might. Which could be interesting because it could be the first same-sex crush. Same. That, that could be pretty big, but as I said, so far, Jodie has behaved yeah. herself. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. The, the Doctor is beyond reproach, okay? The 13th Doctor. But but, uh, but I always keep, I keep getting this hint that maybe Yaz might be interested in that, perhaps. That's another discussion for another, another time. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll just leave that there. All right. So anything else about the 11th Doctor, Amy and Rory? I mean, look, it's always a joy to see Matt Smith on screen and uh, he's always yeah. so much fun. And I think he very much he, being the, the actor who played who, the youngest actor to play this role right. must have been quite a uh, <clears throat> an undertaking, quite a responsibility also. And, uh, and he, he actually he does, he, every time he's on screen, he does a wonderful, wonderful job. And and I just love this this version, you know, and he ha has some great lines and. Yeah, as, and and as I said, I'm glad he didn't make the mistakes that his previous uh, incarnation did. Where he's like, when when you know Amy throws herself at him, he's like, no, I have to make it right. I have to make these two fall in love because obviously he wants to put take them out on a date or, in his yeah. mind, say, I'll take you to someplace romantic so you guys can figure yourselves out. Yeah, he's like any you know, any time anywhere you want, any time you want. One condition: it has to be amazing. Yeah. I so probably he, just stole one of Nick's quotes, but... <laughs> it's okay. No, but his yeah. intentions are, in fact, good. He, that's what he's, he wants to do, is get Amy right. back on track. So I, I like that. And as I said, Matt Smith is, yeah. is, is fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, up till now, you know, Peter Davison was the youngest person to ever play the Doctor until Matt Smith came along. Yeah. So, uh, and Matt, you know, obviously he was even younger, so... So it, was, it, was, it took a little getting used to, I think, for a lot of older fans to see were someone you, that were young you, in a role. Were you, but were you thrown off ahead. at the time when you saw Matt Smith? And, well, when I saw the casting, you mm -hmm. know, and the announcement and whatnot, I was very skeptical until, you know, I saw the 11th hour. And then okay. once I watched the 11th hour, I figured he can do this. I'm sold. Right. Like he, Matt Smith won me over with the 11th hour. So, yeah, which was a great debut which, for him. Which I'm sure, which was a great debut for him, and I'm sure it did with a lot of other fans, especially fans of my age, who mm -hmm. kind of just had to see Matt Smith, you know, in a, in an episode to be convinced that he could do it. And obviously, he could and more more than could, as it turns out, because he's become one of the most popular doctors ever. Yeah, there are a lot of folks who still have them uh, yeah. right up there in their top ten. I believe yeah. or even top three doctors. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, these days, you know, with younger fans, you know, becoming more predominant than us oldies. Um, but I, I still think it's kind of a contest between David Tennant fans and, and Matt Smith fans about who they feel is the best doctor. Yeah, when it, at least when it comes to new who, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for new sh who, definitely. I think so. All right. Uh, topic number two. 
Let's <laughs> move on. Let's talk about Guido, his daughter Isabella, and the Vampire Girls. <laughs> Those hissing vampire girls. Those rather buxom, as the doctor points out, <laughs> vampire girls. His word, not mine, but but I will second it, I guess. Yes. So what are your thoughts on Guido? You know, he's you, – he, I feel really bad for Guido because all he wants is just to get his daughter away from this, you know, this school of girls that turns out to be, you know, this – a bunch of uh, vampires, yeah, you know, because, fish vampires. Because in his mind, it's almost like he's sending his daughter on you know, to a, a higher education or a higher calling. Yeah. It's almost like a... Uh, I'm trying to give her a life by sending her to somewhere where she could possibly do something with her life at the school. Yeah. And uh, this is the thanks I get, I guess. Well, Because you, you, I was actually trying to wonder what they were trying to pass it up as. Is it was I like an academy for women... You know, to either become companions, as in, you know, courtesans or what have you, yeah. which were a thing, of course, or companions right. for women, which was obviously, you know, and they had obviously these schools where these, and they yeah. and even, even later on, they, they would, they, they'd had this where you, you had, you had ladies in waiting, you had attendants, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Or just somebody who literally, you know, would, um, would, would sort of sit next to you and say, oh yes, I think you should do this. or I think you should do that. It's kind of literally right. a companion for these women who were at home, you know, obviously because they, they were confined to the kitchen and to everything else. And so they had to have somebody to talk to, right? Because obviously yes. it was the man who was out working in our very retro, you know, retrograde society where it was the man who was the breadwinner and the woman would stay at home and raise the kids. Very so, patriarchal, yes. Exactly. Yes. So I'm so it's glad. It's 16th that's, century, that's, so go figure, right? That's, and I'm so glad things have somewhat changed for sure. <laughs> but, um, but yes. At least since the, maybe since the 1950s, it only took 300 more years. But, you know, hey, we got there. Got there eventually. Yeah. At least starting to get there. But I, that's I, that obviously so Guido's intentions, of course, are good because like I'm sending my daughter on to become a lady, maybe for a baroness or for a countess or something. So I'm taking out because I assume that he is, even though he's dressed pretty elegantly, I guess he has a very humble life. If you were saying, I'm, I'm not saying he's a pauper, but he probably does not obviously have the means or the ways to give his daughter what he wants to. No, and, uh, he's not he's not upper class by any means, I think. Yeah, he, you know, he's just, he's probably a tradesman or, you know, like a, a merchant, maybe or or, or or yeah, merchant or, you know, somehow he got a hold of all this gunpowder. <laughs> yes. So he could be a smuggler. <laughs> he, he could be a smuggler for all we know. But, you know, that's not exactly the upper class being a smuggler. <laughs> no, exactly. But I, but I like to think he's more just a um, a supplier. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I try, I'm trying to think good of Guido. No, I, I, do, I also think good of him too. But yes, yeah, so, because yeah. evidently he wants his daughter to do well. But then, of course, right. finds out that uh, he has literally lost his daughter because, you know, when when he's told say goodbye to your daughter, and he's like, oh, now, and so she just gets gets taken yep. away. And when he wants to somewhat sort of see how she's getting on, he notices that she has obviously changed completely and or or is close to changing completely. And then, then, of course, you know, he's totally distraught because she's literally he literally says, this is my world. And um, right. it's it's being literally taken away from him by the Calvieris. So um, I just feel so bad for him. And I have to say, he looks so good in Rory's sweater. It was so <laughs> cool to see him wear it. Yeah, apparently that was um, it wasn't something that um, Toby Whithouse came up with. But apparently, I guess he and Stephen Moffat, they came up with this decision like, you know, it would look kind of funny if Guido was wearing Rory Stack party T-shirt or, you know, sweatshirt. I thought it was hilarious. They swap clothes. He's there yeah. on the gondola wearing he's, this. Yes. <laughs> oh, God, that's hilarious. No, but he's yeah, great... you know, you almost, it would be kind of funny, like, if he was just, you know, singing That's Amore on the, on the gondola. and <laughs> Exactly. As, he's, as he's using the punt to go down the river and, yeah, it would be pretty funny. But yeah, of course, that it all becomes about uh, wanting to save his daughter, and then of course he makes the ultimate sacrifice, which is very, very sad. And, you know, yes. of course, you know, killing, I suppose, all the all the uh, the vampire girls in the process. But uh, 
But yeah, he, you know, he is that tragic character. He kind of reminded me a little bit of the, the chap that we'd seen in um, in the Doctor Who movie, the guy in the wheelchair yeah. who literally sacrifices himself for the greater good, which is exactly right. what Grigor does. Yeah. Luckily, we have... Well, you know, his, well, his daughter is killed. Isabella, is, poor Isabella is killed. Yeah, because she's sacrificed, yeah. Yeah, because uh, apparently they thought that... Because um, she helps Amy escape. Yeah, she helped Amy escape, and so, you know, that's apparently not good. So, hey, you know, I know we need women, but we can always get more, so we can... Uh, so we'll just kill this one. And so they... they the, this is where we get the first threat of the the blokes under the under the water when she gets kind of thrown into the canal. Yeah, she gets and fed he, to the fed to the fishes, literally. Num 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 num. Yeah. <laughs> and so I felt really bad because so, I did so that. much for sleeping with the fishes. I guess. <laughs> yes, and yeah, it did remind me, as I said, of that Doctor Who moment from um, from the Peter Cushing movie. With the exception, at least we get some good music here. It's not celebrate good. <laughs> There wasn't that. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean that kind of um, do, 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 like do, 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 the amusement park carnival merry-go-round type music? That almost like playing. disco music going on. It's like yeah, <laughs> even though the guy's dying, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Had it been done maybe in the seventies, you would still be getting those almost fanfares of da 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 da. It's like that. Yeah. You know? yeah. But <laughs> well, at least you got not exactly not exactly capturing the tone. That's right. We, Here we, we actually as we discussed. Yeah. But, so I definitely do miss Guido. I mean, and I appreciate his, you know, his sacrifice course is very much appreciated because literally foils a big part of uh, Lady Calvieri's plan. So, yeah, because he takes out uh, all those uh, vampire girls who, you know, yeah, just were in the process. going around. I, it was almost kind of like a revenge because remember they, every time that he would try to get Isabella, one of those girls would be like right around the corner baring her fangs at Guido. Yeah reminding him of the threat that his daughter was in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, with like now that his daughter has sadly been taken from him, uh, he decides, okay, that's it. I have really nothing to live for. My daughter's dead. There's these vampire girls. Somebody's got to do something about them. So he, he voluntarily elects to take himself off the board by lighting the gunpowder. And, yeah. and then, you know, fish vampires everywhere. <laughs> That's right. But uh, yep. yeah, so, so I, as I said, he was a very sympathetic character. And uh, you know, the fact that I, and I love how much he warms up to the doctor and his team and how they, th- that's why it's always so sad when you see these folks go, because yeah. it really seemed like they were bonding, you know, even around the table and doing all the kind of the fun planning that you get in these kind of shows. And it's like, yeah. dang, it would have been nice for the doctor to maybe visit Venice again someday and see. Yeah, it could have been again. a nice guy to- yeah, that would have been nice. I agree. You know, because they did have that great moment, like you said, they're sitting around the table discussing the plan, and the doctor is trying to. You know, there's that great moment where the doctor is, you know, telling everybody to be quiet. Like he puts his ma- hand over Amy and Rory's mouth, and then he kind of, because he's run out of hands, he looks over at Guido down the down the table and gestures to Rory to put his hand over Guido's mouth. Yeah, so so they really are bonding. So I was very sad yeah. to see him go. And the vampire girls, here's my only gripe I have with the vampire girls. They could have had right. better better teeth appliances, I'm just gonna say. The false teeth yeah. was a little were a little bit exaggerated. They, yeah, I mean well they were well, you know, they weren't traditional vampires. No, yeah, because it weren't just the two fangs, obviously, which are typical yeah. the typical vampire fangs, which you have of course. But it really did seem like they, they went out and shopped at the nearest Halloween store and got what they could and just popped yeah. them in. <laughs> it's a little low budget. Yeah, a little little low rent. As but much, I think they were trying I think they were trying to go for a piranha vibe. Yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Very much the piranha. I think that's you make a great point there, Charles. Because after all, we do find out they are literally space fish. So you're yeah. going to go with something that has those almost razor sharp teeth, which is yeah. more of a piranha than than a, yeah. But it was just it was just cra- also the camera movements did not help because we'd cut to them just smiling with these beautiful and then yeah. dun, and, then, and it's like what the hell <laughs> right right yeah there was no transition it's like one one shot would be oh hey they have perfect human teeth and then the next shot boom you know full fangs yeah the cut so, was a little bit <laughs> a little bit abrupt yeah exactly it's like okay did these things just like split second shot out like boom 
or or what is that? How did that work? Yeah, in fact, I don't know where the director's saying cut, but he put in yeah. the banks, roll. <laughs> right. All right. He probably went like, okay, freeze, slaps the teeth in, action. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a bit abrupt. But other right. than that, uh, I did get kind of the vibe of Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, the way they were played. and I, that's the, one brides of, of, the Brides of Dracula, exactly. And, and that's one of my favorite vampire movies, you know, aside from going way, way back to the Nosferatus and what have you. But um, yeah. Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula is still a, a big favorite of mine. So I did get that kind of vibe. Maybe that was what they were going for. I don't know. What did you make of that? I, I think so. I think so. I mean... You know, the Vampire Brides, especially since that Gary Oldman Dracula movie, mm -hmm. have been you know very popular in the in the vampire mythos when you're telling Dracula, mm -hmm. because they are in the book. You know the original Bram Stoker. They novel. are yes. So, but I think it's just recently. I mean, they did kind of have a little bit of, um, you know, uh, featuring. I guess I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. They they they. They did kind of appear during the Hammer horror film era mm -hmm. a little bit, but primarily, you know, in other Dracula adaptations, they kind of were forgotten about for a good long time until that Gary Oldman movie. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cause I guess, Which I think, kind of brought them back into the, the public consciousness, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Yeah, because I think Francis Ford Coppola really wanted to do something very, very close to the novel. And so that's yeah. why he actually, he actually read the book, unlike some right. folks. Go figure. Why, wacky idea. Like, hey, we're making a Dracula movie. Okay. Maybe I should read the book. <laughs> Maybe I should make, try to make it like Dracula, the book. <laughs> Crazy, right? Source material. It's right there. Yeah. So yeah. so that, that's the, the, the impression I got. Because we didn't really get much else of them kind of snarling and kind of looking, looking kind of, uh, you know, um, menacing. Because other yeah. than kind of, and then, you know, and just saying, you know. They were just, uh, they were just hissing, going, shh. And that's about it. Right? Yeah, or, or, or maybe trying to act a little bit sultry when it came to the doctor, you know, all all talking together, kind of very shining moment. It's like, who are you? Yeah. And, and they're all of them saying it in unison. But yeah. other than that, you didn't really get much, if you will. No, but it did kind of give the doctor, and you know, to kind of do the vampire trope. Of the um, mirror. Looking in the mirror and not seeing their reflection. Right. Which kind of puts you on a little bit of like, well, maybe they're not aliens. Maybe they are traditional vampires because the, you can't see the reflection. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, it's Doctor Who. It has to be aliens, right? Here's the thing. Did you like how they explained away all the vampire tropes, you know, through, shall we say, science? Well, kind of. I mean, I do appreciate the fact that because, you know, Blade did that quite a bit too, the Blade mm -hmm. movies. Yes, it did. Where, you know, you're like the UV lights is essentially what they're, you know, they can't stand. Mm -hmm. And they're so almost that's like why infection. When the, when the, they, they, yeah, they, right. um, yeah. You know, so, it, so it, it, it's treating the vampirism like an infection. But in this case, it's because the UV, heat of the UV light, I think. Because as we find out through the course of this, they're, they're moisture vampires, right? That's right. They don't, you know, so... Consequently, you know, the UV light, the heat of it is going to make them dry out, exactly. presumably. They could have used the, the, the moisturize me, moisturize me <laughs> in, that, in this case as a little nod. Yeah, then you could cut to a commercial of um, the Lady Cassandra going like, hey, buy new Pond's moisturizing cream because, you know, and, and remember, moisturize me, moisturize me. <laughs> I thought it could have been a nice, a nice moment there. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. They do in in Blade. They literally treat vampirism as a disease, and mm -hmm. uh, and I did like that. Rory tries to make the sign of the cross, and obviously it doesn't work. No. Well, you know, probably because you have to. It, it, it's not so much the symbol as it. We find out a lot of these horror, you know, especially vampire movies. It's the faith behind it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because if your faith is weak, traditionally those. Those, you know, the holy using, symbols and you're the holy symbols, you know, like if you're using a cross or a star of David or whatever, um, those don't work if you don't have the true faith behind it. If you don't believe. That's right. And then and then they get you. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I just love Rory. Going, <laughs> it's like, no. Yeah. Well, you know, it's he, he pulled a Hail Mary. No pun intended. 
And uh, <laughs> I'm and, glad we didn't uh, get into the garlic stuff. Interestingly, nobody mentioned garlic at all, which was curious. Yeah, we, yeah, we didn't do that one, but it could have been interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't tag. They didn't tackle all the tropes. Needless to say, right? You know, like being buried in the you know, the earth or being in coffins. We didn't really see them in coffins either, did we? Mm, no, exactly. We no, no. I mean, I suppose they had to do some of them. It's like they wanted to yeah. give the idea that it might be vampires or fool you into thinking they were vampires. But obviously, right. you know, at some point they're like, okay, yeah. All right. Uh, topic number three. Let's move on. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about Rosanna Cavieri, Signora Rosanna Cavieri, and Francesco, her son, presumably, who's got a bunch of brothers. They're <laughs> just looking for a mate, a mate. <laughs> and um, so, as we find out through the course of this story, especially when... Rosanna decides, well, hey, I'm going to go ahead and just destroy our, the city, destroy Venice, because our secret plan is, well, only the males of the species survived this trip from Saturn 9, their home planet. And Rosanna and Francesca want to sink the city into the water and convert the girls into compatible girlfriends mm-hmm. so that they can continue to procreate their race. So what did you make of this plan for one? And what did you make of of Helen McCrory and um, uh, the actor Alex Price as uh, as our two villains in this one? First off, I wonder whether they used Saturnine, you know, almost as a play on words, because obviously for folks who don't know the term Saturnine actually means somebody's almost like gloomy or sad or depressed or yeah. dark. So I wonder right. whether it could maybe play into that a little bit and maybe it was a little play on words there. But other than that, great performances between the two. Once again, we have to have the mommy issues because he's such a mama's boy, isn't he? I mean, he, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Little he bit. maybe, yeah. yeah, he's like, don't talk badly about my mother. You know. <laughs> <just kind> of... <laughs> yeah, he was cool with Rory insulting him. And it was like, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you did not just do a mama joke on me. You know, like... <laughs> He's like, oh, you don't insult train. my mama. That's it. That's it. Now I'm throwing down. Like, of course, in pure, they had to do the whole pure Italian thing of, of course, you can't talk badly about our mothers. You know, you can right. say any, the worst things to us, but you don't touch the mothers. You know, that's, the, that's the, I guess, the so deal. That was a, so that was a bit of an Italian stereotype. I think it was maybe a dig me. because, of course, like, you're in Venice. What are you going to do? So, yeah. um, but uh, maybe they, tr- they tried to make it feel more Italian instead of Croatian by having Francesco and, you know, be offended by insults to his mother. Yeah, because he's like being called, I don't know, fish face and I don't know, all this kind of stuff, yeah. and stinky breath, or Lord knows what else he's being told. And then as soon as he said the, the mother thing, he's like, you talk badly about my mother, you shall die. And so off he goes. But um, no, I, I, I do think there is very much that mama's boy relationship. Granted, I think he does want to kind of make it on his own. She's very much obviously the domineering matriarch, which is typical in Italian society. Or at least oh, okay. especially more the south than the north, which is interesting. But um, other than that, yes, the mother is always obviously very sacred to uh, to uh, certain parts of Italy. So, okay. Um, I mean, See, was... I knew you would be the perfect person to discuss this story. <laughs> well, there, there is, you know, and obviously I don't want to go into too much of a long thing here, but the whole thing, of course, of Nero and his mother, were there was very much that whole thing going on when it comes to ancient Rome. Apparently, right. he had a very domineering mother, and people thought that maybe she kind of was in love with her son. But you know, we're not going to go into 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 the the whole deal with Agrippina and the and the Nero, <laughs> but. It did remind me. Now, of now, now I want to talk the Romans, the William Hartnell story. Oh, we, we, we definitely have to because I'm a, I, I might have to actually uh, book that one, Charles, because I'm there a go. huge sucker for ancient Rome and, uh, and yeah, nobody's the, talked to that one yet here on the podcast. So we might have to do the Romans together. And I believe that Nero is in that one, isn't it? I think it's Nero. That's why that's yeah, it is Nero. That's why I mentioned it. Yeah. Excellent. Then we'll definitely, definitely have to they would put me down for that one. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> so that parenthesis aside, yes, he I mean, I think he wants to make it on his own. And he's like, oh, mother, I want to do this. And I want to do that. And she almost does not seem to want to give him the freedom that he'd like to have. Because she's very much on his shoulder constantly. I think he wants to be the man, if you will. 
but yeah. uh, I don't think she really lets him. And um, and I think he's more proactive and almost, almost want to kind of jump into actually with the impetuousness of youth. But uh, but she's like almost like calm down, son. You know, we have to wait till till we get and and it right. seems like they have enough women at this point. But I don't get exactly what her big plan yeah. is. I mean, how many women does she want at this point? Well, we don't know for one how many blokes there are under the under the canal, right? True. Francesco so included there, on the surface. Yeah. There could be hundreds. There could be thousands for all we know. And at most we've seen, what, six vampire girls? That's right. So you think there's so, going to be a long one. You're going to take a while yeah, to either, either, that number of mates. For, for either her. the vampire girls are going to be very tired yes. or, or uh, they're going to have to make more vampire girls. That's what I'm blokes. That's what I'm assuming. I mean, other than that, yes. I mean, Francesco, I think was was fun. I think. Um, I think. Uh, did you like the way? He, did you like the way that Amy took him off the board with the, the mirror? I thought that was fun. I thought it was it was a it was a fun little uh, little thing. Uh, you know, he got what he deserved, and of course, I mean, he seems like quite the able fighter, as you said. They they cut. They, there was a more extended fight between the two. Yeah. I mean, it did seem maybe a little bit brief, but I guess at certain points, like, okay, we have to get to the point where Amy blasts this guy and uh, Rory and Amy are back together. So I enjoyed him. I think Lady Caldieri very much steals the show in this because she's, I mean, she's the domineering mother. She is the villain, the villain, if you will, but she's also a very tragic character at the same time because especially when her and the doctor have that talk towards the end, where they both, you know, up until this point, as far as the doctor is concerned, I mean, he he feels he's the only one left of his kind. He's, I mean, obviously, at this point, we we figured, as far as he knows, he's the last of the time. he's the last of the time lords, and he's right. come across another, uh, you know, another species or another alien race, and they are the last members or the surviving members of their species. So she's kind of like, doctor, don't you see my point of view here? Your world was destroyed, ours was destroyed. And um, and it brings in the bigger story arc of the the silence because that's what they were running from as well. So we find right. it also I think gives us the audience the how big how far reaching the silence is at this point because that's obviously the overreaching arc in this story. Yeah. Is the silence. Yeah, she she mentions you know when they're when they're talking you know when they she confirms that she's from the planet Saturnine and all that they she makes that comment silence. And the end of all things, mm. which is something that's repeated at the very end of the episode as the doctor's replaying it in his mind. So, you know, this by this point, you know, obviously we don't know what the silence are. Right. And we don't, you know, we get another tease in, you know, the, the Pandora opens the Big Bang when there's that mysterious, ominous voice in the TARDIS that says, silence must fall. And right before everything goes all explodey on the TARDIS console. So, yeah. so what did you make of that? Did you think that was, you know, important at the time when you first saw that? Well, I mean, my ears did prick up when she mentioned the thing about the cracks in the walls as well, because apparently she'd experienced that as well. So, like, this must be what we're what we're what we're getting to. It's almost like the bad wolf with uh, the Ninth Doctor. This is yeah. what this was like the big overreaching arc when it came to this. The over the overarching story. Yeah, plot. yeah. that's right. Yeah. So I thought to myself, that kind of made my ears prick up. I mean, there had been previous episodes where the silence had been mentioned again. So like, okay, mm-hmm. this is the nth, you know, like bad wolf thing that we we get. This is our yeah. our bad wolf moment. This is our theme for the season. Yeah. So I, I I dug it. I mean, I did see. I was like, oh, I'm intrigued. I want to see what because at this point you didn't know whether the silence w- was an alien race, whether it was an right. event, what it was going to be. So I was intrigued. But um, the character herself, as I said, she was very tragic because I think she yeah. just wanted her species to survive. Once again, going about it the completely wrong way. It's like right. I, I'd rather sacrifice a town in order for my species to thrive. Which, of course, is not the best way about going things. But um, other than that, I see where she was coming from. She wanted to yeah. bring back her species. She wanted to repopulate her, um, you know, her, uh, the, the, you know, her race. So I, I was with that. And I think the doctor somewhat sympathizes with her, but he kind of does call her out on, you're going about it the wrong way. 
and he is actually distraught when she kills herself. Yeah, he is. I mean, he's he's bothered by it. Well, for one thing, she drops this big guilt trip on him before she kills herself. Mm-hmm. She says, "Here's another race on your conscience, doctor. Yeah. See ya." Yes, exactly. And then she takes the she does the nasty plunge into the canal, but um, she there's an obscure reference for everybody. So <laughs> the what I thought was interesting was that the doctor and Isabella is you know feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong here, mm-hmm. but they seem to have kind of a flirtation going. Yes, because I think she almost sees him as almost like a companion for her or like a spouse yeah. for her. Like maybe a, you know, a mate potential for her, yeah. perhaps. Because, you know, she doesn't, you know, there, there, there is no, um, if she, you know, she's the, you know, the, the matriarch, there's no, there's no male concubine, whatever, for her. Yeah. So maybe she sees... The doctor being this time lord, and you know they they make this the the doctor makes this joke, It's like, come on, really, you, you know, you know, a you know a time lord and a fish pan yeah, Think of the children. <laughs> think of the children, right? But <laughs> but they do have kind of a strange flirtation going, it, it, and it is, yeah. and it lasts until the doctor realizes that, um, is a or excuse me, Rosanna didn't know Isabella's name. Yeah. Sacrificed her, very callous about it, and you know just that showed the, showed the doctor at least that Rosanna was all about you know just the the plan. She didn't mm-hmm. care about the people she was hurting to accomplish her goal, and that really set the doctor off and made him determined yes. to take her down. Yeah, because it almost seemed like. He- yeah, because at first they actually seemed that he did espouse her cause. Of like, I feel really bad for you that you're the last yeah. of your kind, and and I see what you're trying to do, and and what have you. But yeah, because to him, obviously, it's all about saving the people. And he, I believe, he actually then threatens her, saying, "I will destroy everything you you you, you, you know, bring you down to rubble because right. you forgot you didn't even know what uh, what her name was." Because it shows Isabella's you, think, name, yeah. I think it shows you, I think, how, um, yeah, it, once again, I think strengthens the fact that the Doctor is all about the people. Every single individual matters to him. Right. Unlike... Uh, Everyone's you know, important, yes. That's right, that's right. Unlike Lady Calvieri... As it should be. Just, yeah. Unlike Lady Calvieri, who just is more the end justifies the means. Yeah. And that's obviously what sets them at odds, so that, you know, she hatches her plan to, like, oh, hey, let's just sink the city... Mm-hmm. By causing this big storm and flood it, presumably. But the doctor climbs up on this tower and uh, disables the device. Saves I mean, the day. Sun comes out. It's, it's you know, it's he's painting the rainbows with sunshine, to use the Phantom <laughs> Zone term of late. I, I, like, I like that. But or painting actually, the clouds with sunshine, I I, I actually wanted your opinion on that, Charles. I mean, what did you think of Lady Calvieri's grand plan, the whole sort of machine, you know, to create yeah. the storm and and the controls being on the throne. I mean, did you buy into her, her big plan? Well, I mean, it, feel, it did feel a little repetitive because we kind of saw something a little bit similar in the Idiot's Lantern, right? Mm. You know, the Doctor has to climb up on a very high thing to disable this machine to save the day. But, I mean, it's it's interesting, at least. So... I mean, like, I, I get why they did it, but it did seem like kind of feel like a little bit like, well, I kind of saw that before. It wasn't a very original solution to this problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not to mention the well, fact that he doesn't really do much figuring out or anything. So yeah. He doesn't really apply his genius as he as he has in other situations, because he like tells Rory and Amy, just rip the cords out at random. You know, right. Just, just, just destroy whatever you see. It doesn't matter. And I'll just climb up and, and do the rest. Turn the power off. Turn it back on. Maybe it'll reboot somehow. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's like, or, or slam you your, like your fist on the screen and it might work. You know? Yeah. Do that. Yeah. Do the, you know, do what I do. Just, you know, thump your fist on the console and see if that, that fixes it. Right. Yeah, so it seemed a little bit um, ham-fisted, if you will, and a little bit uh, primitive for the Doctor. Right, right. Did you think the Doctor would be there with his sonic screwdriver figuring everything out? It's like, no, just yeah. rip the cords out. Yeah, well, and it's only finally where he, 
He, the thing's whirling around. He's all fumbling around, not sure what to touch first. And then finally, at the last possible second, of course, he notices the off switch. So it's almost like if you ever saw the movie Goldfinger. Yes. You know, where where James Bond, he's trying to disable this bomb, and it's ticking down, ticking down. And of course, it stops at a, the number 007, what seven a, seconds what left. What a surprise. When, when when Felix Leiter comes in and is like, oh, here's the off switch, idiot. It, yeah. shut, it saves the day. Yeah, in fact, uh, I thought that was a little bit okay. I mean, rather than that, I mean, uh, I, I suppose it was yeah. it was fun, I guess, to see the Doctor being a little bit heroic and doing the whole, right. I'm climbing up the mountain kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But yeah, the, uh, other than that, I said, we know the Doctor is a highly intelligent man. He could have figured it out in another way, too. I'm sure. I'm sure he could have. Maybe just you know, was trying to make it more difficult and so we could have more fun with it. I, don't I know. suppose. All right. So anything else about the story that well, we overlooked? All in all, I, I mean, I did enjoy it. It, I think it's, you know, definitely not, you know, one of the top episodes in the Matt yeah. Smith run, but it's definitely a fun one. It doesn't that, have to be, I don't think. No. I mean, I, I enjoyed revisiting it. Uh, it has some great moments, some great Matt Smith moments. And the only other thing, thing that saddens me is, as we mentioned, it's the beginning of uh, Rory being constantly emasculated. And I'm glad that yeah. eventually he realizes that he is just as good as anybody else and he doesn't have to... You know, have to feel so so bad about himself. So that was. Well, the I one. think that kind of, I think that kind of changes a little bit after his experience as a a Roman auton. That's see, but that's what it, it takes. It takes him to, to, to get go through that know, experience. Yeah, well, you know, he had the man who waited two thousand years. You know, so that's right. After multiple kicks in the groin, he's right. like, okay, I yeah. can do something now. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So. Uh, so I'm glad they figured out Rory eventually. Right? Eventually they got there, yes. <laughs> All right. Do you have any favorite quotes? Okay, story? I have a couple. I mean, one of them, in fact, does come from Rory when Matt, when um, the doctor mentions Casanova. And Rory's like, yeah. you owe Casanova a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of fun. And, um, and then of Well, course, as, a fun, as a fun side note, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. David Tennant actually played Casanova. Casanova, yep. On the, on the Casanova series, so... It's kind of funny, you know, a little bit, if you think about that, that way. It's like, oh, no, I don't want to run into myself. Exactly. I thought it was a, it was nice nod to possibly that for sure. Then, of course, yeah. Rory and Francesco, where Rory's like, you stink of fish. And Francesco answers, well, I'm hardly like the smell of cheese and biscuits. <laughs> that was right. nice. And, um, and then the, lastly, there was, a, there was a nice one which I, between the doctor and Rosanna, where the doctor's like, why are you here? And Rosanna says, we ran from the silence. Why are you here? And he's like, wedding present, the silence. And then the, the, there were the cracks, some were tiny, some were as big as the sky. Though some we saw worlds and people, and through others we saw silence and the end of all things. We fled to an ocean like ours, and the crack snapped shut behind us, and Saturnine was lost. Ooh, that's a good one. I like that one. I like the very dramatic ones. Me too. <laughs> so, but I do like the funny ones too, as I'll, I'll, I'll share here in a minute. My favorite quotes had to be at the beginning of the episode where the doctor pops out of the stripper cake mm. during Rory's stag party. The doctor's like, Rory, that's a relief. Thought I burst out of the wrong cake again. That reminds me, there's a girl sitting outside in a bikini. <laughs> Can someone let her in, give her a jumper? Loosely, Lucy, lovely girl, diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> so I like that. I like Rory's line to the doctor when he confronts him mm -hmm. about the danger he poses, where Rory says, you know what's dangerous about you? It's not that you make people take risks. It's that you make them want to impress you. Mm. You make it so they don't want to let you down. You have no idea how dangerous you make people to themselves when you're around. Very good. Rory, dro Rory dropping some truth on the doctor there. And then, so, see, if he had grown a pair like he had in that moment, yeah. I'm sure Amy would probably have been swooning over him every five minutes. Right. Well, maybe because she wasn't there, he felt confident that he could talk could like that. Mm hmm Yeah. But, but you know, he gets there. Give, give Rory's credit. He, he's a, you know, he's, he's, um, He's a late bloomer, 
but he got there, right? That's right. Yes. That's right. And let's see. Rory and Amy and the doctor talking about the, uh, you know, the, the creatures in the canal. Rory saying, you can't repopulate somewhere with just women. You need blokes. <laughs> Amy, Amy's like, she's got blokes in the canal. She said she had 10,000 husbands waiting for her in the water. So I guess there were 10,000 of them, right? Right. And the doctor adds, only the male offspring survived the journey here. She's got 10,000 children swimming around the canals, waiting for mom to make them some compatible girlfriends. Ugh. I mean, I've been around a bit, but really, that's, that's, ugh. <laughs> and yes, it does leave that plot hole, enormous plot hole that you're saying, Charlie. Yeah. They leave Venice and these blokes are still happily in the water. There's 10,000 blokes still in the canal. Come on. <laughs> Clean your mess up, doctor. All right. Exactly. All right, so what's your rating for this one? I'm going to give this, I think, 8 out of 10 chopped up brooms. Okay. I'm a little more generous than you on this one. I give this one 8.5 out of 10 library cards with a photo of the first doctor. Nice. Yeah, that was, that was, that's always a, that was a great Easter egg. I, you know, it always makes me smile every time I see that moment. I am a sucker for a classic era Easter egg. You and me both. Who. I, you know, I, I admit it. So, okay, you got me, Doctor Who. <laughs> well, heck, the yeah. 11th hour when we see all the doctors go through in sequence, I was yep. geeking out like there was no, no How tomorrow. can you not? How can you not? Exactly. Well, that was the, really the first time I think, well, we did kind of see them a little bit in um, the next Doctor where, you know, they're flipping through yes. the, oh, and also the Journal of Impossible Things from um, the... Uh, human nature, yep. the family of blood, but that's but always this was fun. you know, but it, but this one we finally got them all in order, and it was a kind of a really cool because we got to see clips. Yeah, them. exactly. No, I, I was uh, I was geeking out big time that moment. Yeah, it was very cool, very cool. Mm. All right, uh, reverse the polarity. So, if you enjoyed the Vampires of Venice, we're going to. I'm going to recommend that we go. Back, way, way back to 1980 with State of Decay. Ooh, good choice. The, four, the fourth serial from season 18 in 1980, written by Terrence Dix, the late, great Terrence Dix. And in this one, imprisoned in the isolated universe of East Space, the fourth Doctor and the second Romana land on a strange world ruled by King Zargo and Queen Camille who live in barbaric luxury high atop their tower while holding their starving pe peasants in poverty. Scientific inquiry has been suppressed, but hidden in the hills is a team of rebels led by the scientifically curious Kalmar who have made their headquarters within a dump of rusting technology of mysterious origin. Hmm. The Time Lords are captured by Kalmar's rebels, but manage to persuade them as fellow scientists that they should be allowed to go free. Later, the king and queen receive the pair with superficial cordiality, you know, kind of like what uh, Rosanna did with the doctor. Yep. Which soon erodes when the doctor mentions the contents of the th of a thousand-year-old spaceship's log he glimpsed at the rebels' HQ. Uh -huh. Proceedings are interrupted by the rural counselor, Akon, giving the doctor and Romana a chance to explore. Meanwhile, Tardis stowaway Adric is caught stealing a loaf of bread from the, ple the peasant villager's hall. He falls... Oh, Adric. He, rest in peace, Adric. <laughs> rest in peace, Adric. Yeah, no, no. You know, he's still alive. There he is, yes. I just yes, think there. about... Oh, I, you mean, like, oh, you mean... You're, like the you're thinking of Earthshock. I'm you're like the doctor. I, have, I, I, I remember what happened way back when, yes. And I yeah, still, yeah, I still right. shed a tear for, for Adric on those yeah, rainy uh, nights. His... His broken mathematical badge for ex or excellence for mathematics, that kind of thing. Yeah. And that uh, silent credits and that ran. Um, so he falls into the clutches of Akon, who has come to make his selection of youth for service in the tower. 
Romana and the Doctor discover that the tower is really a flora-encrusted spacecraft which originally left Earth 1,000 years ago and, like the TARDIS, got drawn into e-space. The scout ships forming the three turrets are the only parts of the vessel still in working order. They also discover the three rulers are the original officers of the, sh- of the ship, somehow still alive. Further shield searching yields the horrific truth. Drained bodies of u- village youths, fuel tanks filled with blood, Zargo, Camilla, and Akon are, you guessed it, vampires. And proper vampires, as it turns out. And their master, one of the great vampires of Time Lore legend, sleeps beneath the tower, almost ready to awaken after hundred years, hundreds of years of dormancy. After Romana is caught and prepared for sacrifice, the doctor persuades Kalmar to lead a concerted attack on the tower. And while this diverts the guards, the doctor programs one of the needle nose scout ships to launch and come right back down to skewer the great vampire through the heart killing it permanently. Ah! Nice. Staked him. <laughs> and with the great vampire dispatched, the three vampire lords crumble to dust. See, this doctor cleaned up after himself. Mm-hmm. The doctor finds Romana and Adric, and as they leave the planet, hoping that, now freed from the vampires, it will develop once again towards its former advanced state, and perhaps even surpass it. The end. Nice, very nice. I, I think that's but that's that was a great, great choice, Charles. If I may, I might yeah. also uh, sure. say for those who like the most uh, the aquatic creatures, I thought maybe the sea devils could have been a good choice as well. That's a good one. That's even, a good one. That's another one we haven't talked about here on next time. Or, or even or even Fury from the Deep, which is another one that has not yep. been discussed yep. yet. Yep. See, lots of still great, lots of great stories still out there, Nick. I'm just telling you. They're all out there waiting for you. <laughs> well, I, all right. I, you're, you're baiting me literally to use another another seafaring oh, reference. That... <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yes, sunk hook, line, and sinker. And I think we're done after this. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's see if we can claw our way back from that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to match puns with me, man. I'll, I'll, I'll take you down. I'll take you down. All right. So we did get some feedback from our wonderful regular writers, Holly Mack and Dave Proctor, writing in once again about this time, of course, about the Vampires of Venice. Yay. Yay. So Holly writes in, hey, Charles and Nick. Hey, hey Holly. Holly. Holly's so good about writing to us on the Phantom Zone, you guys. So she Nick is and I are always very dedicated. Approved. Appreciative of that. I'll have to send her a little Oscar statue, I think. Uh, the Oscar for I think you... best writer goes to. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like that. Ah, Vampires of Venice. Ah, Venice. Oh, wait. That's Indiana Jones. <laughs> I forgot how good of an episode this was. It's been a few years since I've rewatched it. The opening with the doctor jumping out of Rory's stag cake and then paraphrasing another doctor's line about wanting to talk about someone had me chuckling. The doctor wasn't too thrilled when he didn't get the normal reactions from Rory when someone new sees the TARDIS for the first time. Well, you did admit to kissing his fiance. Also, uh, also love how the doctor is trying to play marriage counselor before the wedding. Somebody had to. Keep that, keep that in the back of your brain, doctor. You're going to need it again a few years down the road. Instead of blood for these vampires, it's water. Nice twist. Yeah, I thought so. Mm -hmm. All I can say is that at least the doctor wasn't susceptible to the lady vampires that a certain librarian from another TV show that dealt with vampires was and had to be saved by his own charges. For those wondering, she's referring to Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the episode Buffy vs. Dracula. Mm -hmm. Good episode, but back to the main topic, she says. (laughs) Yeah, we we could get on a Buffy discussion if you want. But, that, Holly, but see, you know, that, that's why Holly does grow up the five-ish fangos because they love their tangents. Exactly. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, we've done one or two tangents ourselves here on this podcast. So yes, I, I cast zero aspersions on that. <laughs> Same here. Because <laughs> uh, otherwise we'd be struck by lightning probably and not get super speed in the process. <laughs> 
He was also good at putting two and two together that they were in something different when they couldn't see their reflections. Love the library card and that it has a picture of the first doctor. Yeah, we do. Of course, Rosanna could see through the psychic paper. Yeah, of course. I wonder if these vampires aren't some offshoot of the plasmavore vampires or the plasmavore, but need, but with a severe need for water. Hmm. That's That's interesting interesting. theory. Yeah. 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 We get the first name, name drop of the silence, which doesn't really become a major part until the next season. And we're at the very end, sort of, of this season. Mm-hmm. But we don't get to see him until next season. I, get, I take your point. We get the, uh, let's see, Guido sacrificing himself to make sure that Dr. Amy and Rory get out and stop Rosanna was perfect. Yep. It's a good sacrifice. Sacrifice fly if you're a baseball fan. <laughs> Rory, nice try with a broom, but your mama jokes aren't going to cut it against Francesco. Mm-hmm. At least these fish shrimp vamps go poof with enough sunlight. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, is it wrong that I kind of just, you know, wanted to kind of like throw them in a, a, some hot water and break out the butter? I, I, Charles, at that moment, I was like, oh man, I wish I had yeah. some calamari to fry up right. because I would like... I... <laughs> I love me the fried clams. I'm just saying. You and me both. That's some yeah. good eating. It is. It is. See, we need to go hit a seafood place if we ever get there. If I get over to Italy, if they've got mm-hmm. one. Oh yes, multiple yeah. ones. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to that. All right. Uh, lastly, the uh, yep, the doctor's right. He and Rory are Amy's boys. I'll wrap it up here, Holly from Wisconsin. Thank you, Holly. Cheers, Holly. Thank you so much for writing in. Mm-hmm. As always, and uh, stay tuned because Holly, uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about Holly here in a minute. Ooh, nice! I'm gonna tease that for now. Dave Proctor writes in, of course, about the Vampires of Venice. Hello in the TARDIS. Well, hello, Dave. First hey, off, Dave. I want to say, first off, I want to say, I hope that Jesse is doing well. You know, so do we. We can only hope. Yeah, fingers crossed, <laughs> everybody. Next, I want to say that I hope you guys are doing well. Well, so do we. But <laughs> Then I want to say it's good to be back for some modern who. Matt Smith, not really my favorite doctor, but I do love Amy and Rory. I also love River Song, but she's not in this one. Those three are the salvation of the Matt Smith years to me. Not that he is bad, just uh, he didn't, re- I doesn't resonate with him as much as the other doctors that's fair yeah and alex kingston is fan is phenomenal yeah yeah granted uh, me i love matt i think he's awesome i think he's well, you're, you're me both Personally, yeah 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 but i don't begrudge anybody for that uh each week i start taking notes for my email not knowing where it's going to turn out <laughs> kind of like this podcast this week i have a few notes but mostly i make note of some great quotes I'm sure these are the quotes that you guys used as well, but here we go anyway. The doctor really is clueless and proves it when he appears at the Bachelor Party's debate, uh, telling everyone that Amy kissed him and further, she is a great kisser. He tries to make up, make it up to them with a wedding gift of a trip to Venice. Of course, there are aliens there. Well, yeah. What's a wedding gift without aliens, man? (laughs) Come on. I enjoyed when Rory steals the thunder of not saying it's bigger on the inside. He owes the doctor a punch in the jaw, and this is a much better one than a real one. Amy's instinct is admirable. Like a first responder in the modern world, she runs towards screaming and after wrongdoers, even if they're vampires. It's true. Yes. It's respect. All right, for that. I like the second paper showing a picture ID of the first doctor. Clever tip to the hat to the overall continuity. Yes, indeed. Great quote. Makes you wonder what could be so bad it doesn't actually mind us thinking it's a vampire. Ooh, nice one. That's a good one. Great doctor joke. She kissed me and you kissed her back. No, I kissed her mouth. <laughs> that is such... Ba-da-ba-da. Yeah, exactly. That is I gotta such do, British I, humor. I gotta, I gotta do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. I'll be here all week. (laughs) We'll be here all week. Be sure to tip the waitress. All right. Uh, Great exchange. Doctor, I can't see a thing. Rory, just as well as I brought this then, ultraviolet. Doctor, portable sunlight. Rory, yours is bigger than mine. Doctor says, let's not go there. Rory to the doctor, do you know what's dangerous? (laughs) 
But yeah, okay. So he did he did the same thing that I did about Rory. Yeah. Uh, another quote: "This ends today. I will tear down the house of Cavieri, stone by stone. And you know why? You didn't know Isabella's name. Yeah. You didn't know Isabella's name. It matters more when you repeat it twice. Yeah. It's more dramatic that way." Hey, look at this. Got my spaceship. Got my boys. My work here is done. Uh, we are not her boys. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> okay. I love all the B story about Rory and Amy may, way more than I like the f- part about the fish people. I give this episode a seven and a half. I thought it was a purple lightsaber at first, but it's just a portable ultraviolet lamp. <laughs> nice they, one. Mace Windu reference, yeah, yeah. If you if you watch the uh, the prequels, you know that reference. Have a great week, Pre- peace and prosperity to all. Thank you, Dave. Cheers, Dave. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, we always hear love hearing from you too, and thanks for the nice shout out to Jesse. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I want to echo Dave's thoughts. Obviously, Nick and I, we we want everybody to keep Jesse in your thoughts. You know, reach out to him, let him know that you're you're in his corner and. You know, he's got a very important surgery coming up here in just about a week or just over a week. Yeah. So uh, fingers crossed that he gets through that okay. And uh, we'll see where we go from there. Exactly. Everybody. For sure. All awesome. right. So Jesse, Jesse, our thoughts are definitely with you and your family as well. Always, All right. always. All right. So if you want to be like Holly and David, please do write to us. Next Stop Everywhere, SMG at gmail.com. That's Next Stop Everywhere, SMG for the South D Media Group. At gmail.com, where you can find us on Twitter at Next Stop SMG on Twitter, Facebook, of course, Next Stop Everywhere, the Dr. Who podcast, or Instagram at Next Stop Everywhere podcast. And Nick, where can they find you and hear about all the things you're up to out there in time and space? Well, that, and it's quite a, quite a journey for sure, folks. So if you are fans of country music, you can um, check out my radio show, Whiskey and Cigarettes, where we play today's country, traditional country, and everything else in between. For more information about that, you can visit our website, whiskeyandcigarettesshow.com. Podcast-wise, superhero movies are your speed, no problem. I do host the Happiness and Darkness, a superhero movie podcast. We discuss all superhero movies under the sun. You can find us I've on heard Facebook. of that one. <laughs> you just might have yes you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram and last but certainly not least gold standard the oscars podcast where myself and those lovely ladies who answer the names of zan Spras and rachel friend we're reviewing all the best picture winners from 1927's wings the present day we've just entered the 50s and in the two weeks in next week we will be reviewing that interesting movie which is the greatest show on earth so that's going to be uh, a, a, a fun one for us. So, uh, yeah, and you can, of course, find uh, Gold Standard on Facebook and the Twitter machine. And what about you, Charles? Well, Nick, as for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs in here in Ohio, and my blog of said geeky things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot. We're talking about all the stuff we talk about here at Next Stop Everywhere. So Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sergey and Adventures, Big Finish Audios, and more. All kinds of comic book sci-fi news, news and other podcasts for the South Gay Media Group, including, well, hey, that aforementioned The Phantom Zone podcast, where Nick and I are currently going through Jupiter's Legacy, this Netflix series based on the image comic series by Mark Millar and Frank Whiteley. And we're having some very interesting discussions. Yes, we are. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking us out on the Phantom Zone. I, you know, it's so great to to have Nick here, and it almost felt like a little bit like Next Stop Phantom Zone to me. <laughs> yes, the crossover, I guess. The crossover episode you didn't know you wanted, but you're getting anyway. <laughs> well said. Nick and I, yeah, we just have a lot of fun. And after we finish up with Jupiter's Legacy, of course, we're going to be talking, we're going back to the Marvel Cinematic Universe Mm -hmm. to discuss Loki. Very excited about that one. Which is less than a month away now. Yes. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Time flies when you're avoiding the time variance authority. (laughs) You understand that reference when Loki comes out. Yep. And then Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast to do with Zan Sprouse, where we talk about all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, et cetera, et cetera. Usually more the et cetera sometimes. <laughs> but right now we're going through Hotel Room, which is the 1993 HBO series. Only lasted like three episodes, and they aired all of them on the same day. So it's kind of obscure what we're going through right now, but it's very interesting. 
Mm-hmm. And we're going to be discussing the second episode hopefully tomorrow. And I hope everybody checks that out as we build ever closer to our 100th episode wow. of Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast. So I guess we should probably start planning that one then. Mm-hmm. And then last but certainly not least, Drunk Cinema, where a certain DJ Nick is kind enough to do the intros for every <laughs> time. And we definitely appreciate you doing that, sir, of course. You ought to listen to the intro. He does a great job. <laughs> and I'm very appreciative of it. But, you know, Zan and I, we, we have adult beverages. We have adult conversation. We kick back, watch our favorite movies. And last time we watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm-hmm. Great review, by the way. Loved it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. One of my all-time favorite movies. So needless to say, I was a little bit geeked for this one more than usual. <laughs> and, you know, Zan really loves this movie as well. So it was great that we got to kind of share this movie with mm-hmm. each other. Hopefully one day we'll get to watch it in person together. But for right now, we do this. And then coming up with our 11th episode, next time we're going to be discussing the 1985 murder mystery movie based on a board game, Clue. And it's not going to be just Zan and I for this one, because joining us as our very first special guest host, Christine Peruski of, of course, Next Stop Everywhere fame, is going to be joining us, and it's going to be our first three-person review on Drunk Cinema, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope everybody checks it out. We got we had to kind of wait a little bit extra, a couple weeks extra for Christine because of her schedule, but we worked it out, so we did Raiders instead, and so now we did that one, and now we're going to talk Clue at long last. Yay. And I'm really looking forward to it. I hope everybody, please, check it out, because I think it's going to be a great one. I've never seen this movie before. Really? But it's a personal favorite of Zan and, and Christine's. Yep, and Rachel's, as I'd actually mentioned. On, yeah, Ra- uh, yeah Rachel's as well. So so hopefully, Rachel, if you're listening, I definitely hope that you'll write in with some feedback to uh, Drunk Cinema. Mm-hmm. And uh, give us, share your thoughts about Clue so we can read it on the podcast. But it should be very interesting. Christine's already pro-offered her Clue drinking game. Ooh, okay. So Gauntlet is thrown. <laughs> so we'll see what happens, as I'm sure I'm going to get peer pressured like nobody's business between Zan and Christine coming up on our next episode of Drug Cinema. I salute you, the man who rides the bus, <laughs> who drives the bus, I should say. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the designated podcaster, as I like to say, on that show. But, uh, I do, you know, I drink a beer, you know, I try to loosen up, but I'm more of a social drinker. Mm. But I, I know that Zan and Christine are, are they get a little, uh, I don't know if they're just annoyed with me that I don't drink more or frustrated or what, but I'm sure they're going to be trying to pressure me into drinking more. So we'll, we'll see we, who's the stronger will. Exactly. It'll be a battle of the wolves. But as I said, Charles, somebody Spoilers, has to drive. Spoilers, it's me. <laughs> but as I said, somebody has to drive the bus, right? Yeah, exactly. I like to think so. Drive the bus off a, off a cliff, but you know <laughs> that's how it goes sometimes. So please check out our podcast. We definitely appreciate it. And that's all I have. But, Nick, thank you so much for filling in. I know uh, I kind of juggled the schedule around to make this happen. But I really appreciate you helping us out, you know, especially with Jesse gone. And uh, I had a ball talking <laughs> Doctor Who with you. I, I always do. But we've had such a good rapport mm-hmm. on the Phantom Zone. At least I like to think so. Sure. And it brings a smile to my face to, to talk Doctor Who with you. It really oh, well, does. Likewise, Charles. I mean, you know. So I... don't be a stranger, okay? <laughs> well, I said I'm I'm always happy any time you allow me to, to play in this sandbox. So it's always. Uh, a... I don't have to allow you. You have an open invitation, sir. Well, thank you very much. No, no. It was a great joy. And, you know, definitely looking forward. Now that, uh, as I said, you've thrown quite a bit of bait at me, you know, between the Romans and the. Uh, Fear yep. from the Deep and the Sea Devils. I reckon I'm going to have to go back to my little Doctor Who DVD collection and say, okay, which one shall I discuss with Charles next? <laughs> well, you know, there is a new John Pertwee Blu-ray set coming out. Mm-hmm. I think it's uh, season eight. Correct. Uh, we, which has the, you know, we already kind of talked Terror of the Autumns, but that doesn't stop us from doing a commentary episode. Very true. Those, if we've already discussed the story on Next Stop Everywhere. Mm-hmm. So that's always an option, too. All right. Thank you again, Nick. Pleasure. Hope you come back soon. And everybody else, come back next time on Next Stop Everywhere, episode 233, as we stay in the Matt Smith era Ooh. to discuss closing time. Oh, nice one. So break out the semi-sonic. Closing time. <laughs> one last bit for alcohol. Maybe I should save that for Drunk Cinema, right? There you go. This is a fun one if you've ever watched this one. Oh, it's fabulous. 
Joining us as special guest companion will be, once again, the great Holly Mack mm-hmm. from the Five-ish Fangirls podcast, featuring the return of James Corden as Craig Owens, but most importantly, the debut of Stormageddon, Dark Lord of All. <laughs> yeah, it's great. definitely a fun, fun, uh, fun episode. You know, I, I actually prefer James Corden. And oh, this... maybe the Cybermen as well, you know. Exactly, Cybermats and Cybermen and whatever. But... Right, Cybermats, yeah, no big deal, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm actually a fan of James Corden in this compared to his actual talk show. He gets annoying yeah. there, but here he's great. Yes, yes, he does. <laughs> yes, he does. He's no Craig Ferguson. Let's just put nope. it that way. Nope. He wishes he was, but he ain't. <laughs> yeah. Every time I see James Corden on Late Show, Late Late Show, I just like, can we get Craig Ferguson back, please? Exactly. You're good on Doctor Who, mate. You know, don't do that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just know your limits, James Corden. <laughs> Stay in your lane. <laughs> Stay in your lane. Stay away from cat movies, that kind of thing. <laughs> please. Yes. But that's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you, Nick, again. Everybody else, yeah, come on back. Closing time. Holly Mack's going to be here. I'm going to be here. Sadly, Nick's going to be somewhere else, but hopefully you'll be listening. I will. We'll see you next time right here on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Bye, everybody. Joe.